Hi, my name is Joe Williams. I'm with US News and World Report. I'm a senior editor here and I cover social determinants of health. We're here to talk today with CEO of Common Spirit Health, Lloyd Dean. Uh, he's a man on a mission. Uh, I've interviewed him a couple of times and he is a person who you want to talk to, who you want to see if you're poor or you're homeless and you have no health care. He focuses on underserved communities. That's one of his passions in addition to providing health care for all, for millions of people coast to coast practically. And uh, as CEO of Common Spirit, he's here to talk to us today about the pandemic. He's here to talk to us also about social determinants of health and maybe make a little news in the process. So Lloyd, welcome, it's nice to see you. Well, it's great to see you, uh, Joe, and thank you for this opportunity to, to share some of my thoughts on behalf of uh, Common Spirit uh, Health. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, in your presence and these are, uh, very challenging times, not only for the world, but for the uh, nation and at the center of what we're all dealing with uh, is health and health care and the health infrastructure. Well, that's that's fascinating. Uh, that the fascinating time that we're in because all things are converging at once. I mean, on one hand, you've got a global pandemic. On the other hand, you've got protests for social justice, and they've kind of converged in a way that nobody has really anticipated. On the one hand, the uh, the pandemic has been shown to disproportionately affect African-Americans and Latinos, while the calls for social justice have only underscored the disparities between whites and blacks, especially when it comes to health. But even beyond that, uh, I understand that you've got some news for us, especially when it comes to social determinants of health and making sure we kind of level the playing field when it comes to health and healthy and living healthy and people's access to health care. Yes, um, and I would just preface my comments by saying one of the things that uh, this pandemic has uh, taught us uh, that as a na nation, as a healthcare uh, system, uh, that we all should be uh, concerned about. Uh, and that is the role that technology and innovation uh, can uh, play to ensure that we, in a very focused and demonstrative way, uh, can have an impact on not just uh, health uh, disparities, uh, but health injustices. And we at Common Spirit uh, Health uh, think that partnerships is one of the vehicles uh, that is critical uh, to achieve and to make the change that we all are calling out uh, in our communities. Uh, so I'm pleased uh, today to talk about uh, two partnerships that we have. Uh, one of them is new, and it's with an, uh, an organization called a Concert Health. And they are doing something really, really unique uh, that, uh, again, we have seen uh, the results of not having uh, what they do uh, and how it negatively impacts uh, not only people of color, uh, but the poor and the most vulnerable, but uh, communities at large. So what we are doing is we are extending behavioral health, which we know, we've seen it called out on television, and we know uh, that people are presenting uh, at our hospital and at our care sites. And in addition to their medical uh, and clinical needs, uh, they are also needing behavioral health services. So what this partnership does is it puts the primary care physician at the center of one's cares and helps them navigate to make sure that they receive uh, the necessary uh, behavioral health uh, services. And when you think about the tension, when you think about uh, the pressure, when you think about uh, what people are experiencing, particularly uh, people of color, but communities at large, with the stress of just being in this environment, the stress of being uh, at home, the stress of not knowing what's going to happen in terms of the health of a community. This is a vital partnership for us and one that we're very uh, excited about. Uh, also, we are expanding our uh, partnership with Docent uh, Health. Uh, and what we're doing there is we are, we are addressing 
the maternal and orthopedic needs uh, that mothers and patients uh, have. And uh, we did a study uh, together and the results were fascinating. We studied 10,000 uh, patients and we found that by working together, 60% of those uh, patients who are all also happen to be Medicaid and Medicare, that we were able to reduce their length of stay uh, by these new uh, services and these partnerships. Uh, on the neonatal uh, side, where uh, there are many, many complex complications, uh, we were able to shorten the length of stay by 1.8 day. Uh, we reduce uh, the preterm births by 37%. And with our orthopedic patients, uh, we found that by working together uh, through this relationship, uh, they experienced a 45% shorter uh, length of stay. And the one critical metric uh, that we all focus on uh, in healthcare is the, our readmission rate. And we were able to lower that by 30 uh, seven, I'm sorry, 71%. So I, I would just summarize, and thank you for the question, that mm -hmm. using innovation and using technology and taking it to the community, particularly the most underserved, particularly people of color at, who, as you said, have a disproportionate impact and more deaths uh, from this uh, pandemic, uh, we can make a difference. But but we can't do it all alone. So that's why partnerships are. Well, well, that's some really interesting news. I mean, two things. The first is uh, using uh, or integrating uh, behavioral health into primary care. That's huge. I mean, we don't have a lot of that going on, not even in the, the, the insurer paid uh, private sector. And integrating that seems like it's, it's going to take uh, a huge burden off of people who, when they're trying to get uh, health and also make sure that their health their, their behavioral health and their physical health, because a lot of them, 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 them they play into one, one another, don't they? Yeah, and I'm, you know, I, you know we see this every day um, in our hospitals and in our access points. Uh, people who, yes, they have, as I mentioned earlier, clinical needs, uh, but they are just uh, longing and desperately need uh, help on the behavioral uh, health side. And, well, and as it, affects, nation, it affects everything from, from heart, you know, from blood pressure, heart, uh, high uh, blood pressure, heart disease, smoking, uh, obesity, all of them, uh, all of those determinants of health are kind of tied into behavioral health. Yes. And we know that if we can address and ensure that patients and community members have access to behavioral health services, that it, as you said, bridges uh, and allows them to be able to more effectively and to get better outcomes from their, what I'll call core uh, clinical challenges. Mm -hmm. Now talk to me a little bit about uh, the other partnership you announced. You mentioned maternal births had gone down uh, when you partnered uh, with the data firm. Tell me how that happens because maternal health and maternal uh, 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 deaths it's been, a, it's been hugely in the news, especially among African-American women. It's like one of the most, uh, we have the highest rate in the Western world of, of women who die in maternal birth, and those uh, births tend to be among people of color. Yeah, and when we looked at that and really began to study it and to try to get to the root cause, one of the things that, we, uh, that jumped out at us is that uh, navigating through the healthcare environment, particularly uh, around these types of services, uh, in many cases were a obstacle uh, to people uh, getting the care that they need. So what we're doing is utilizing a virtual care and personally, from a personalized perspective, uh, helping people get the services uh, that they uh, need. Because if, if, if we can help them navigate through the system and that and we can connect with them from a virtual standpoint and be there for them, we know and we can track and we can document 
uh, that we can uh, effectively uh, make a positive uh, impact. Wow, that's, that's uh, completely amazing. It's really big news. Um, I'd be interested to see where it goes and, and uh, cover it from a, a new standpoint when we uh, next speak. But uh, I wanted to get your impressions about what's going on in the world right now. Talk to me a little bit about uh, COVID-19, uh, the disparate number of Black communities that have been ravaged by, ravaged by the disease, and where we go from here. Give me your overview. What, what does this moment in history tell you? Yeah, this moment in history tells me that we are at uh, an inflection point. We have talked about uh, health disparities. We've talked about health injustices uh, for decades. And I think that we have been tinkering around uh, the surface. We know that if we can address uh, chronic conditions, that we can change uh, the whole uh, landscape. Uh, but we also are at a point where the virus has shown us that what happens to you in a community and the care that you have available to you and the equity and the justice of that care impacts me. The, the one thing about the virus, I use the term, it has been the great equalizer. It didn't matter whether you were you know, the most financially uh, stable. It didn't matter the color of your skin. And I'll come back uh, to that. But the virus was an equal, if you will, uh, application. So yeah, when I it, think it about, uh, yeah, the pan, and I think where we are right now in the nation, uh, Joe, we've got an opportunity here to do a, a few things. Number one is to call out the impact that institutional racism uh, has had on access and equality of care, to look at the statistics uh, that are right before us that cannot be denied, that African Americans and people of color, indigenous people uh, were impacted in the number of deaths disproportionate uh, to uh, others, and we know why. And it's more than just addressing the clinical issues. We have to come to grips with the role that racial uh, injustice, health inequities, and access to fair and just care have on communities, and particularly the poor, the most vulnerable, and communities of color. And we can do better. And now we know what needs uh, to be done, but we can't do it in isolation. We have right. to look at financial resources. We have to look at community resources. We have to look at housing. We have to look at transportation. And we have to ensure that those needed services are going to be there fairly and equitably mm -hmm. for people of color. It is a shame, a shame that our uh, most vulnerable communities are experiencing the level of deaths and positive cases in comparison to other communities. And exactly. the fact that African Americans died in this virus thus far, four now to five times more mm. than others, is something that is not, uh, should not be accepted by any of us. Well, especially in the world's richest country with one of the most advanced healthcare systems. Now, you mentioned something interesting when you were talking about this. You talked about housing, you talked about transportation, you talked about uh, different facets where institutional racism has really taken root. Um, I want to get your thoughts about uh, the number of counties, I think it's up to maybe 20 or 30 in county, uh, counties, localities, and, and in some instances, uh, governments that have declared racism as a public health issue. Talk about that. Why is that a big deal? And what does it mean in the long term for bringing health equity to everyone? And, and let me just say, I think that those who have called this out, uh, we should be extending a great deal of gratitude for. Because the reason that all of the pieces come together here is that if we are have a system that by its structure 
um, racially discriminates between ethnicities, between the poor and those who have uh, resources, that impacts the healthcare uh, infrastructure. Everyone. It impacts access. So mm -hmm. it leads and sustains this injustice and this inequality. And if, if, if that hypothesis remains true, Coming, coming into the system, getting the kind of quality care that one needs uh, to address their health care needs is going to remain disproportionate. And we right. know that there's measurements and community resources that can be brought to bear where we can and must uh, ensure a ju just, fair, and equal health care infrastructure for all right. communities. Right. And you're talking about when you mentioned how all of these things in intersect and how structural racism impacts how people have their access to health care. You're also uh, brought, you know, if you broaden the lens out a little bit, you can also imagine how uh, just a lifetime of, of microaggressions that people talk about, a lifetime of discrimination, a lifetime of being concerned about poli uh, unfair pol treatment at the hands of police, that coupled with the fact that some neighborhoods are, are, are some poor neighborhoods are it's the legacy of redlining uh it's the legacy of of unrest that has happened 20 30 years ago that really hasn't been addressed those are large structures and what you're saying is that those structures have to change in addition to getting or allowing equal access for treatment to people who are in underserved communities and and we're talking about investment in neighborhoods you're talking about investment in transportation how does that happen uh it, 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 it happens like it's impossible yeah, it, um, great question. It happens in many ways. I, you know, I've talked, um, and I grew up in an environment where yeah, you did. my parents, my parents were fearful of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. They felt that when they accessed it, uh, that they weren't treated equally. They felt that um, there were obstacles that they were looked down upon. They felt that uh, they did not receive the kinds of follow-up care or access to care. And to, be, uh, and to be clear, you didn't grow up in Alabama. You didn't grow no, up. In, no, up in, no, in, no, in no, no. I grew up in. Uh, I was born in Alabama, but I grew up in the Mid uh, West. And in mm -hmm. my community, we had no services. We had to go ten miles to get to get services. My grandmother and my grandfather died early, earlier than they should have, mm -hmm. uh, from conditions uh, because they were afraid and did not feel comfortable and felt that they were not treated uh, in a kind, in a human way. So they gave up on the, the system. And they felt ultimately that the reason was first because of the color of their skin. They just felt that people treated them differently and like they had no uh, intelligence around mm -hmm. what they were feeling or, or, or suffering. So we have to talk about that injustice. We have to talk about uh, racism and we can, and we're at Common Spirit Health, hospital by hospital, community by community. We are not only having the community conversations, uh, but we are looking at what we're doing, how we're doing it, where uh, we're doing it, and working with others to not just address the clinical needs, but these other social determinants of health that you and I have. Right. Had. That's exactly right. And, and one of the things that you said when you talked about the mistrust your grandparents had with the medical system, I mean, there's ample proof that that, that mistrust in some ways was justified. Uh, from the Tuskegee experiment to Henry L. Lacks to all of these uh, things that happened to African Americans over history. And even now, there are studies that prove that there's bias, implicit bias in, in the medical system when you and I go to the doctor. And so having that examined is really a, a, a very important aspect to try to bring the level uh, playing field to, to healthcare. Now, beyond that, I want to get your, your thoughts about where we go from here. If we're talking about changing structures and we're talking about uh, systems that have been in place for generations, if we dismantle them, it's gonna require buy-in not only from the community, right? But it's also gonna require buy-in from 
people like you, folks in the C-suite, people in you know, community leaders, people in politics. Uh, tell me what that means to you and, and how that vision uh, comes to be. What that means to me is that, you know, I'm blessed uh, to be in a position where I have a voice. And I feel a, a heavy accountability uh, as an African-American man, but also as a leader, most importantly, to advocate for change, to make sure that we are a part of the solution and not just talking about the problem. I mean, there's a lot that we can do with our uh, footprint in this nation through our facilities and our 150,000 uh, members of the Common Spirit Health family. But I think, you know, I have to not just be in a community, but we at Common Spirit believe that we have to be of that community. And mm -hmm. what, that, what does that mean? We've got to call, first of all, the one thing that gives me great hope is that we are having these conversations about racism, about right. injustices. Now, not that we haven't had them before, but I think there is something unique about this time in our history when we look at what's happened uh, in our, our, our communities, in our streets, around uh, injustices, addressing this issue uh, of you know, authority and law. Uh, enforcement, and then talking about what are, what's the root cause of that? Because if we get at the root cause of that, we're getting at the re root cause of, I think, some of the chronic uh, imperatives that we have to address. So where I think we're, we go from here, Joe, is that uh, we have to come together and first of all, number one, recognize the problem and be willing to acknowledge that we have a problem. Number two is that we can't keep tinkering around the edges. When we think about violence in communities, when we think about access to healthcare, when we think about uh, nutrition, when we think about housing, uh, when we think about uh, how community services are coordinated, when we think about financial literacy, when we think about having the resources in a community to ensure uh, access, um, I think if we can begin to address those things, uh, that's a big part of it. But we have to get changes in policies. We mm -hmm. have to have a healthcare system that recognizes that health care is a right. It is not a luxury or something uh, for a certain part of our society, but not equal uh, for uh, others. We have to change the financial structure for how we reimburse and pay for uh, our, our, our health system. And finally, and finally, we have to understand that how we treat each other, how we think about others, will manifest itself in what we do in our communities, not just in healthcare, but in um, access uh, to fair and just uh, law in, in, in enforcement, access to housing, yes, access uh, to, to health care, uh, mm -hmm. education. So racism, racism can become the spoke of the wheel. And if we, and all of those things that I just named um, are spokes on that wheel. So we just can't change one of those spokes. We have to get at the root cause. And I think that's what you and I have an obligation, an accountability to speak out and to demonstrably in a measurable way, do something. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And that's uh, truth, right? I mean, it has to get at that level. It's gotta get kind of granular. People have to talk about it. They have to be willing to accept some uncomfortable truths and examine where all of these systems came from. I mean, because again, we're talking about redlining, we're talking about housing discrimination, we're talking about uh, unfair police practices, stuff that's gone on for decades and is even going to go on today. And all of that integrates, it's kind of like a web, you know, it, it, it becomes a web of health uh, where African-Americans are kind of ensnared in a net of sorts. I mean, I think that, that your, uh, your vision there is, is spot on, and I, I'm, I'm anxious to see how it unfolds in the next couple of years. Um, but I did want to also say congratulations on both those mergers and those announcements. It's huge news. I think bringing tech and bringing telehealth 
uh, and making it more accessible for people who are in underserved communities is, is a big deal, uh, as well as attacking uh, through, through, through uh, data and technology and innovation, the maternal mortality problem that's run, run rampant in black communities and the uh, chronic uh, problem where we have uh, behavioral health, but no integration with, with actual physical health and those two we know are inextricably linked. So, and, so I would, what, and I would just, I would just add that to what you just said, Joe, that uh, technology and innovation used properly, properly can give us the data to help us be more precise about how we bring about that change that you and I talked uh, in a community. Data for data's sake is data, but data can be very, very powerful if we apply it to problems in a way that gets us to, as I mentioned, the root, if you will, information so that we can uh, address that and, and bring about change. You don't know where you're gonna go unless you know where you've been and where you exactly. are. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Well, well Lloyd, it's been, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you joining me on this chat. Thank you so awesome. much, congratulations and, and best of luck. Well, thank you. And uh, again, these conversations are so important for this country and for our world right now. And I appreciate uh, you uh, spending this time with me. Thank you. My pleasure.